Today I'm going to talk about Christian resources, the stewardship of those resources. Last week it was about stewardship, Christian stewardship, which is management, right? Management from a Christian perspective. And today I'm going to talk about the resources that are God-given. There's misconception by some people, no, by most people, that the world just popped into existence. But that did not happen. It was created. And it had a creator. And any, any attempt to answer how it could have happened otherwise meets with failure. Every one of them. We have what we call in theology... Um, when you go back and back and back and back, it's just uh, a continuous looking for a source and not being able to find one. Because if you say that, like some people, that extraterrestrials created this all, then who created them, right? Yeah? And, I, and this is really wonderful because the way the Bible, and the Bible is God's work, not man's. And he knows how to start it. He said, in the beginning, God. That settles it right there, doesn't it? You don't have to go any further than that. It's not an eternal retrogression here, looking for a beginning. God is the beginning. Now, where'd God come from? We'll leave that up to God, right? Because he is what's known as the uncaused cause. Everything else has cause, and he's the cause. Amen. So I want to talk about that. Before I do, I think it's really important to mention this because there's a new series out on Netflix. I don't know how many of you have heard about it. It's called The Messiah. 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 And there are a lot of Christians, I guess, getting involved in that. And I don't like to talk about something like this unless I know a little bit about it. So I tuned in check it out. Now, I didn't see the whole first episode. Didn't need to. I noticed that there were problems right from the beginning. So then I went on the web and I decided I'm going to find out what Christian reviews have to say about it. The first line in the Christian view, review was, it's done by Mark Burnett and Roma Downing. I didn't have to go any further. I didn't have to go any further. I did go further, but I didn't have to go any further to realize that this is something to be left alone. For a long time, people were getting their knowledge of God from the Bible. Now we're getting our knowledge of God from Hollywood. You see a problem here? Huh? Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some good films out there. We had one here last Sunday night, three hours. It was word for word from the gospel. That you can handle. But even then, you've got to be careful because there was one scene where the uh, uh, temple guard and the Roman legion or Roman battalion, uh, battalion was sent to arrest Jesus. Not likely, folks. Not likely. What they've done in that particular version is they've taken one word that could mean a mass of people and called it a cohort of soldiers, right? Now, they, they can do that. They can make that. But when you look at the other Gospels, you see that there's no mention of Roman soldiers. Not only that, it stands to reason uh, the Roman soldiers are not going to be dictated to by the temple, right? It was the temple God that went after Jesus, not... So even, even when they were following word for word, there's still some possibilities of a little bit of error. And is that a big deal? Probably not. But it's to let you know that there can be some error there. A little bit of error is all right. doesn't interfere with the plan of salvation. But get your knowledge from the Bible, folks. Not from Hollywood. Not even from this pulpit. You get it from the Bible. And if you have questions... Ask. And those of you who have been studying the word for a long, long time, have some savvy. You know, God calls us and who he calls, he equips, right? So I have some knowledge that maybe you don't. But I'm telling you, 
You check me out with your word. Okay? It's the word of God. That's where you get your information about the Bible. Not from any pulpit and certainly not from Hollywood. Okay? The word of God is living and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword, right? It will give you the ability to discern between truth and fiction. It is of supernatural origin. It is not man-made, no matter what the knuckleheads tell you. The knuckleheads never investigated. If they had, in fact, some of the knuckleheads that do investigate it to that degree turn out to be Christians. How about that? Because the Bible supports itself, by golly. Amen? Okay, so now my message. Stewardship of resources. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, evil words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Proverbs 30, verses nine, uh, 8 and 9. I like this. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the word or the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Neither riches nor poverty. The church is polarized regarding the sub subject of material gain. This polarization may have existed from the beginning, but there is no doubt that it has existed since the 4th century establishment of the church in Rome. From that time on, it appeared that the officers of the church were remiss if they were not wealthy, while the laity was remiss if they were wealthy. Thus, the church preached poverty and self-deprivation, but practiced acquisition and self-gratification. Such hypocrisy blurred the distinction between the spiritual and the carnal, and a mixed message was sent to the people, and many saw Christianity as a deception. That still today. You know? Gandhi, the famous fellow in India, you know, he, he was asked once, you, you're surrounded by Christians. Why aren't you a Christian? He said, hey, you know, I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians. The problem is that we talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. And people are watching because they want a reason not to believe. Satan was establishing himself within organized Christianity back in the 4th century. He'd been trying for three centuries. He certainly made his way in in the 4th. It was around 330 AD that the Catholic Church began. And so what happened was that there was a mixture of pagan uh, beliefs and Christian theology. A mixture. You can't have that. You just can't. And they've been doing that continually from that time on. You find in South America that one of the reasons there's so much lawlessness down there is because the Catholic Church has practiced what's called syncretism for centuries. Where they move into an area and they'll adopt the, hate, the, the pagan practices in order to gain the, the belief of the locals. But you can't do that. You can't mix truth and error. What you end up with is error every time. So that's been going on for a long time. Still going on to some degree, the Catholic Church has a lot of truth mixed in with a lot of error. And whereas they had teeth at one time and you could die as a result of not believing in what they believed, you, they, they would kill you. They can't do that now. They've lost their teeth, but they still have error. And that's why I say, again, it's not what you hear from this pulpit or from any denomination, it's what you read in the Bible that's important. Amen? Amen? 
So the church has lost any spiritual power that it may have had in the beginning. It had gained the world at the expense of its soul. And it goes on today. It's not just the Catholic Church, folks. Methodist Church right now is having big problems. You know, they're splitting because they accept some things that God says and other things they reject. After all, we're not stupid anymore. We've grown up, right? Think again. You know, the, the, the Presbyterian Church split a long time ago. There, you know, I have a book about the denominations in the church. I bought, like, I think about 15 years ago. And at that time, there were like 400 different denominations of Christianity. Now there are over 700. It goes on and on and on. The Bible isn't enough. We've got to form these, uh, these movements with their own ideas and their own beliefs. Well, stick with the Word of God. That won't let you down. In the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas, probably the most highly respected Catholic theologian, declared the church to be spiritually impotent without power. After receiving vast amounts of money, the Pope at that time boasted to Aquinas, no longer must the church say, silver and gold, have I none? What's Thomas's response? No longer can the church say, rise up and walk. See, get this, people. Every one of the reformers was a Catholic priest. Catholicism had the truth. They just mixed it in with error. And there were those priests who saw the truth and left the church. That was the beginning of the denominations, the, the Protestant dominant denominations. And since then, the devil moves into that too. Organized religion is a thing you've got to be careful of, right? Again, go back to the beginning, the Bible. That's where you'll find the truth, not in any denomination and not in the practices of any denomination. It's not ritual and ceremony. It's being transformed by the living word, taking up residence in your soul. That's what's important. Forget about ritual and ceremony. That's energy of the flesh. I do this for you, Lord, and you're going to do that for me. <clears throat> it's nonsense. It's nonsense. What he wants is to work through you, right? Not you work for him, but him work through you. Amen? That's the meaning of grace. It's not, the, it's not unmerited favor. There is unmerited favor, yeah. We don't deserve it, but we get it. But that's not what grace is. It's a divine influence on your heart and its manifestation in your life that you become a product of what you have eaten, Right? You know, ritually eat wafers and wine all you want and have nothing happen to you. But you can't devour this word without being changed. Amen. So my purpose here is not to exalt poverty or to condemn wealth, but to attempt to put things in their right perspective. What is focused on is of paramount importance with regard to Christian stewardship, that is, the believer's management of the resources that are given by God. It's all given by God. The air you breathe. This is what's called logistical grace. We are given everything that pertains to life and godliness. How we use it, how we put it to work for His sake is what management is all about. That's the management of resources. So let's start with the abilities. Everybody has abilities and talents, but not everybody recognizes that God is the one that they come from. You know, he said, I put you together in your mother's womb. We all start differently, but it's how we end that's important. Let's look at Matthew 25, verses 14 to 29. This is the parable of the talents. Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, 
and to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he, had, he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents and talents beside them. His Lord said to, them, said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had gathered or received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who had ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have even what he has will be taken away. Now I find it interesting that the word used in this parable is talents. And it's talking about money. <laughs> it's from the Greek word for weight. And it's derived from a word that means to bear or to bear, as, as in bearing a weight, you know. Uh, it's difficult to find a connection between the original meaning of the word and its use in English, where it's talking about abilities rather than money. But I, I suspect that God has something to do with this. I think he, I find him using words in more than one meaning throughout the scriptures. And this is where with a, you have to have discernment to be able to see what is it that God's really trying to tell you under the surface, beneath the surface. Well, <clears throat> Luke twelve forty eight says, To whom much is given, much is required. It's also said in the word of God, don't be so quick to want to be a teacher, more will be demanded of you. So really, to whom much is given, much is required. We're not all born into wealth. You know, there are people born into poverty. There are people born into wealth that, that, uh, that fail miserably. And there are people who are born into poverty that excel. They excel, they exceed all expectations. So the beginning of the race doesn't matter where you are in the beginning. It's how you run the race, folks. Because it's the end that's important. In this parable, it is the master who gives the ability and it is the servant's responsibility to use what is given to him in a way that will what? Honor his master. What abilities do you have? Do you know that they are God-given? And how are you using them? Do you have them laying dormant? Not being used? The abilities and everything that God gives us should be used to His glory. I can tell you that in the middle mid 60s I was in Australia and I was a folk singer I would sing folk songs in the local coffee houses right 
a lot of uh, protest songs and psycho babble, right? And after a few years, I just decided I didn't want to do this anymore, and I put my guitar up for about 20 years. Didn't even bother with it. But one of the problems I had was, while all my friends in folk music are writing great songs, I couldn't write the first line of a song. Couldn't do a thing with it. You know what? I had buried my talent in the earth. God gave me a talent. I used it on myself. I buried it in the earth. Right? 20 years later, I'm an assistant pastor in a church in Florida. And the pastor wanted to open up the church early in the morning, 5 o'clock, to let people before they go to work come and, and worship and pray. Being an assistant pastor, it was my job to open up the church. I'd be there at 5 o'clock in the morning opening the church. And then the worship leader, who was very good, would take care of leading the worship. Well, after a while, he wasn't able to be there. And I don't know why it was. It has something to do with his kids at school, I think. So I'd be there, and I started just uh, playing tapes. And one day, I don't know exactly when it happened, but just I think that the Lord did it, said, listen, pick up your guitar again and start giving live worship. So I did. And all the way in with my guitar, I'd be praying, Lord, please let me do well. <laughs> I can't sing with a hoot. My guitar playing is terrible now. But you know what happened? I started writing songs. Are my songs good? My talent was for him. That's when I was able to write songs. Before that, I couldn't get the first line out. Praise God. So using your talent for his glory, when you do that, he expands your talent, right? He'll give you what you need in order to glorify him. And you know, you don't have to be a great singer. I'm proof of that. You don't have to be a great musician. I'm proof of that too. And what, what talent I did have is being destroyed because of my shoulders, but it doesn't matter. Pat gets up here and sings, and it is wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful. I will look forward to her singing. Now, is she an opera star? <laughs> no way. <laughs> but she sings from the heart. And that's what's important. Amen? So remember, we have a responsibility to discover our talents. And the talents that God has given us, they must be used to his glory. If they're to expand. Matthew 5 verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What talents I have are to his glory. That's what people need to see. Oh, you've done so well. Thank you, Lord. Right? Yep. Oh, praise God. Right? You hear that from me all the time. Oh, it was a marvelous sermon, uh, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Right? It's always praise God. That's where it comes from. Before, before we come up here from downstairs in the morning, I'm in that room asking the Lord to take my voice, to take words and make his words pour forth from me and not my own. To get revelation from him for his glorification and for your edification. That's what I want every morning. That he be glorified. When the son is glorified, the father is glorified. When the father is glorified, the son is glorified. And when, the, when they're glorified, then we are lifted up. Amen. Amen. In Ephesians 2.10, we're reminded that we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared before that beforehand that we should walk in them. Yeah. Hey, listen, 
who do you associate with? What's your walk? What is your walk? You know, the word says, be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. We see that. We've seen that with people in this, church, in this body here, right? Walk with God. Walk with God. Associate with those who put him first. That's a very big part of Christian responsibility, a very big part of your stewardship of Christian resources, of godly resources. Amen? We are his workmanship. But the confusion about material wealth and the believer's right to it continues to haunt the church at large. We still have those who exalt poverty and in so doing promote the same hypocrisy that plagued the Roman church for so many centuries. There's nothing good about poverty. Nothing. And God is not one who supports poverty. But then again, he doesn't support wealth either. You hear from me all the time. God is not a God of abundance. He's not a God of poverty. He's a God of what? Sufficiency. Sufficiency. So we have the those who exalt poverty and promote the same hypocrisy that plagued the Roman church for so many centuries. But at the other extreme, we have the prosperity theology of the word of faith teaches. This is where spiritual discernment is so important. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6.21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Focus on things that are above, not on things that are below. <clears throat> I would place the biblical view of material stewardship between poverty and prosperity. It's in sufficiency. I would associate poverty theology with asceticism, that is self-deprivation, to deprive yourself, thinking that somehow you gain God's favor for that. It goes right along with this misconception about fasting to glorify God. I go without food. God says, wait a minute, I made you to live on food. <laughs> There's got to be more about that, fellas. There's got to be more about that. Just understand that there is ritual and ceremony. And the more I le read the scriptures, the more convinced I am that our Lord Jesus Christ had no time for either one ritual or ceremony because they will replace the truth every time it's standing in the shadow thinking that you have arrived at the destination I would associate prosperity theology with acquisition carnal man cannot be trusted with wealth it'll destroy him and I would associate stewardship theology with gratitude, Christian stewardship with gratitude, to recognize where everything you have, all that pertains to life and godliness, comes from him. And the greatest of all of these is where he says, uh, I have given you everything, great and precious promises, everything that you need to live and to grow. Why? That you may be partakers of my divine nature. That's why. Not so that you can have a yacht. Not so you can have the biggest and best house on the block. Not so you can have the best job in the world or big bank account. That you may be a partaker of my divine nature. So which of these is God-centered? Which will promote spiritual growth or maturity? which is likely to promote human desire and opinion over and above holy desire and divine wisdom? Well, two questions come to mind. Is it God's place to serve man or is it man's place to serve God? And I tell you, the way you serve him is not by working for him, it's by allowing him to work through you. Even our time is from him. 
How do you spend your time? What do you do with it? Who do you hang around with? We've all heard that we should seek the giver and not the gift, or rather than the gift. And that's good advice. What all men seek is peace, security, and pleasure. Isn't that true? No matter who you are, everybody wants the same thing. We all want security, peace, pleasure, meaningful existence. I don't care who you are. Those are the things you want, aren't they? That's every human being that ever lived wants those things. The difference is what you do to attain them, what you believe you need in order to achieve those things. That's the difference. Man pursues happiness just as Solomon did through the flesh and the things of this world. But true security and happiness are only to be found at the feet of Jesus. This is the law of reciprocity. The law of reciprocity. Give and it shall be given to you. Press down, overflowing. You know? That's Luke 6.38. Luke 6.38. The law of reciprocity. What's reciprocity? It means it's, it's like for every action there's re equal and opposite reaction. Newton's third law. You know? Where your treasure? No, 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 no. Go to uh, Luke six thirty-eight. Yeah, Luke six thirty-eight. Now, Luke six thirty-eight is quoted over and over and over and over again from pulpits all over the. Well, probably all over the world talking about tithing. I will tell you that is not true. It is not about tithing. Given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. It's about generosity, folks. It's about generosity. And it's not just about money. It's about your, what you do with people and for people. If you meet a need rather than doing a deed, then you have accomplished divine character. That is not about tithing. Tithing is about 10% of your earnings going to the Lord's work. Tithing never guaranteed that you were going to become wealthy. Tithing never said that it was going to do great and marvelous things for you. And tithing is about obedience. Tithing is about following God's leading, saying, God, I rely on you. You all getting this, you in the, in the web? It's the law of reciprocity. Given, it will be given to you. Have a care about other people. Meet their needs whenever you can. And by that, I don't mean to let the shiftless take control either. You know, be careful that you don't just encourage somebody in their bad behavior. But when there's a genuine need and you can need, you can need it, by golly, you'd better. Because that's what Jesus would do. The law of reciprocity. God promised in, four, in Philippians 4.19 that he would supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. But how? Through Jesus. That means asking as Jesus would ask and asking for what Jesus would ask for. I can't see Jesus asking for a Cadillac. I can see him asking, you know, Lord, give me a means to get from A to B. Yeah. You follow me? <laughs> Jesus taught that we could expect to be provided for, but not that God would raise us to economic and materialist, materialistic might. The old nature, get this, get this. The old nature cannot be trusted with material wealth. And the new nature does not require it. Amen. 
So what does your soul cry out for? Well, I once had a vision. Some of you know about it, but other people who don't, I'm going to tell it. I was standing in the pulpit in a church that I was pastoring in Florida, assistant pastor. My job, I hated it, was to uh, get the offering. And uh, I stood up to do that at the pulpit, and suddenly somebody started speaking in tongues and giving a message, and the whole the whole congregation just erupted. And they were running around, and they were all yelling and, and happy as could be. And, and I'm standing there thinking, what is going on? And I had a vision, folks. I had a vision. I've only had a couple of visions in my life, but this was one of them. I had this vision while I'm standing there. I saw Jesus standing in the midst of all these beautiful presents beautifully wrapped and the people all coming up and taking the presents and bowing and thanking him for them and walking away with them and he's standing there and he's got a tear running down his cheek and he's saying but I'm the present I'm the gift take me the church is so busy trying to get God to do things for them and what God wants is allow me to work through you and watch what I do. Amen. So what does your soul cry out for? Mm. As we realize that all our needs are met in the person of Jesus, he becomes our focus, our goal. Our provision is found in him. He assures us in John 14, verses 13 to 14, and whatever you ask for in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. In my name. In the name of Jesus, more than a tag on the end of a prayer. It's a proclamation of authority and a reminder that any request made of God must be in accordance with the character of Christ Jesus. Don't think that you can ask for things that Jesus wouldn't ask for and expect to get an answer. Oh, you have an answer? Probably no. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17 assures us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things hold together he holds everything together you know I joke about it but it's not so much of a joke when people want to know what gravity is you know it's been a mystery for a long time we know what gravity does but what is it and the physicists, come, they come up with possibilities. But I'm here to tell you, gravity is Jesus. Jesus holds everything together. Right? I know, there are people laughing about that one. But he, he is order. We live in a chaotic universe and a chaotic world and a chaotic culture. And a chaotic civilization. But we also live in a kingdom. And that kingdom is law and order. That kingdom is the exact opposite of chaos. That kingdom is growth, not destruction. Amen. Let us reach for Jesus. Make him number one. Preeminent. The preeminence of Christ. Make him more important than anything else in the world. Everything else filtered through his character. And do this with the same urgency as a drowning person would be reaching for air. And as he is made manifest in us, as he takes up residence in us, as we are transformed, right? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the intake of Bible doctrine, that you might be a manifestation of divine will and character. That's what it's all about. 
And as he is made manifest in us, we will find the anxieties and the concerns of life falling away. And we will be good stewards of all that he has given us because he has put within us the desire to give glory to God for all that we have. Gratitude toward God is essential to good Christian stewardship. And I say again, he inhabits the praises of his people. This house should be filled on a Wednesday night, folks. It should be filled on a Wednesday night. How many people are here on a Wednesday night? Raise your hands. Is it wonderful? Is it? Absolutely. Amen. It's worth. What would you put above that? That's the point. What would you put above getting together and glorifying our Creator? Our Lord Jesus. Right? Not television. I won't go any further than that. Nothing else. Nothing else. Amen?